Recording in progress. Okay, praise the Lord. All right. All right, praise the Lord. Uh, for those uh, joining us either now or in the future. <laughs> we got dogs barking. We got everything because we are outside in the park here to celebrate God's God's goodness and hear from him. Praise the Lord. And so uh, we're just learning this thing, figuring it all out how we can make it work. But God is good. We can sense that we're right where we need to be. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful blessing, this wonderful gift. And we... Uh, we thank you for being with us and and all the wonderful celebration we've already had in worshiping you and giving testimony of your goodness. It's time for your word. I thank you for the privilege of uh, being the one to deliver this word today, but let you be the one who speaks through your Holy Spirit, not me. Not help me not use any of my own resources so that your word does not, it moves and does not return void, but accomplishes what it's set out to do. So we surrender this time to you and we eagerly wait what you have for us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Into the word. Now, I know you're all here at least used to seeing. Um, used to seeing the words on the screen. Now you're just going to have to stare at me and listen to my voice. Huh? Amen. <laughs> okay. All right. Our opening verses come from the book of Titus. Chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. And it says, But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, and really this is the crux of the verse, but I'm going to finish it. The kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit which we sang about today, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Amen. Praise Amen. the Lord. So what a, what a wonderful thing that God has done, and we become heirs into his kingdom. But really what we're here to talk about is his unearned love. That's the title of this sermon today. We didn't do anything to earn it, but it's his amazing unearned love, and it's who he is. As we all know, God is love, Amen. and he can't do anything but love. That's just the bottom line. And today we're going to hear more about that uh, because uh, I had a revelation of my own this past week, and I realized... Um, he took me to a new place of understanding that I've always asked the Lord to, to share with me, help me understand how much he loves me and help me. Because I think when we really understand it, we can really find rest for our soul, right? I mean, when we understand that he's not waiting to destroy us and everything, and it's, maybe we know it in our minds, but to really know it in our hearts is so important. And so that's what we're going to talk about today, unearned love. Praise the Lord. Let's get started. John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. We know 16 is the, the most, probably the most famous verse in the Bible. Uh, it says, For so God, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Amen. It is the, uh, there's no accident that it's a very popular verse because it is, it sums up God's heart to mankind. It is that he, we were desperately in trouble, all of us. And yet, instead of that, he brought forth his son, his only begotten, his chosen son, born of his Holy Spirit, to live on this earth without sin so that ultimately, finally, there could be a perfect sacrifice for our sins. And that is love. That is most definitely love. He didn't have to do it. He could have started over, but he didn't. Praise the Lord. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8 through 10 says, But let us who are of the day, that's those who are in Christ, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, 
and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. But God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Amen? Whether we're alive in this earth, whether we're asleep at night, or whether we sleep in the biblical sense and the spiritual sense of not being here anymore on this planet, we will be with him no matter what, because that's what he wants. He wants us. Amen? Praise the Lord. We did nothing to earn it. God has the same love for all people. He truly does. And this is something that I pray that we can all get in our hearts. All people, praise the Lord. In Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14, it talks about when Jesus was born. And he's over there in the manger. And the, uh, it's at night. And we pick it up in verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Amen? Praise the Lord. This is God's heart for all mankind, for everyone. He does not want anyone to perish, but all to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ because he loves each and every one of you and all the people around us. Amen? Praise the Lord. This subtitle is called From Enemies to Sons and Daughters because that's our story. Amen? In uh, Romans chapter 5, verses 6 and 8, it says, For when we will... When we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely a, uh, for a righteous man one will die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, enemies of Christ, enemies of God, Christ died for us. Amen? Think about your worst enemy, the person who persecutes you the most. most. And, then, and then God says, I want you to give your life for that person. I want you to lay down your life and take a bullet for that person. Will we be able to do something like that? But we were all enemies with God. We were all against him. And yet he laid down his own life for us. What, a, what an amazing love that is. Amen. In John, 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 2, it says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. You see, we were once enemies. He redeemed us. He didn't just redeem us. We are now his children. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. That's why we're persecuted until he draws them and then they join us in love as children of God. Amen? Therefore, the world does not know him because it does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Amen? And he is love. And we will see him as that, and he will cause us to be like him, and the world will see that he is loved through us. Amen? Praise the Lord. I think there's some more on that to follow. But we were talking about going from enemies to sons and daughters of God. We are now just, not just sons and daughters. We are heirs to the kingdom of God. We are part of the family of God. Praise the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 10, it says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loves us, 
even when we are dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We used to come out to parks like this in our flesh and it was nice and it was fun, but now we come and we see the glory of God in it. We see that we are in the heavenly places because we can see in the spirit that we couldn't see before, amen? That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. In the ages to come, it's eternal life. There's no more worrying about death anymore. We are his. We are his. We are his. We will never stop being his. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. We can't even boast about our faith, because it's God who gave us the faith to believe in the first place. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. If we did something that we were good enough to earn God's love and earn eternal life, then we wouldn't need God, we'd just be God ourselves, And that's never going to work, and that's why the law is there to prove it. We can't be good on our own. And so it's a tutor to bring us to Christ, the one who is good that we trust in. Amen? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Amen? We of ourselves can do nothing, but whatever God wants to do through us, that's how he, he already has a plan. If, if, he, if he has a plan for us to just receive him and come into paradise, then that's the plan, like the thief on the cross. But if we're here, he has good works that he wants to do through us. He just wants us to rest in him and follow him, and you end up in a park being blessed as you share the word and sing worship. Amen? Praise the Lord. More about being reconciled in Christ in Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 through 23. For it pleased the Father that in him all, and in him being Jesus Christ, all the fullness should dwell. And by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated, and here it is, enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. So we were enemies with God, more proof. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. That's amazing right there because he sees Christ, because he sees the blood. Excuse me. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and not, are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which, we, which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Amen. So Paul was the one sharing this word, but this is the, the part that stood out to me. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, not to turn from the truth of God's love and what he has done, what he is doing, and what he will do in each and every one of our lives. It's faith in him that will get us to the finish line. Amen? How could we be moved away? We could, we could miss Egypt and rather go back to the world instead of following him like they did in the wilderness. But today we're going to talk about something else because we're focusing on the love of God. How could we move away from God who loves us so much? One of the ways we can is by starting trying again to earn our, his love to, for us. Trying to be, do things to make him love us more. And what that does is actually harden our hearts from the fact that he already loves us. From him working in us and through us is because we're trying so hard to earn his love, which we don't have to do, brothers and sisters. Romans chapter 4, verses 3 and 4 says, For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. We know Abraham, God said, get up, you and your family, leave this place and follow me. He got up and he left. That was his righteousness, by believing that what God had to say was the right thing to do. 
Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. So if we don't believe that God has done it all, that he will do it all, then we are not, we're unbelief. And now we're, it's counted as debt against us. And the relationship is, is, is fractured because we think that we don't, he doesn't love us enough because we're not doing enough and it can affect things. I think um, well, I got a subtitle here. God is not looking for what we can do for him. He is not. He, he, we cannot help God. God doesn't need any help. He's doing it all. And all he wants is for us to believe him and love him and spend time with him. And, and he'll do the rest. He has a wonderful plan. And again, he loves all mankind. So if we really believe that, there's nothing for us to do but follow him and just follow his lead and trust him even when it doesn't make sense in our own mind. Amen? Um, in Luke chapter 10, we're going to look at uh, a little sort of an example of this. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Now it happened as they went that he, being Jesus, entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus's feet and heard his word. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus's feet and heard his word. We're not just talking about reading the Bible or listening to a sermon, brothers and sisters, sitting at his feet and listening for his leading his instruction, his to follow him and listen to his voice. This is all, he, he did it all for us to be able to do that right there. But Martha was distracted with much serving and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me because she felt that she had to do all this stuff to keep pleasing God, possibly. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. Amen? We are not here today in this park because we're trying to please God. We are not here in this park because we figure we got to do more. We are here because God has spoken to us and said, it's time to come out and share my love with this world. Go to that park and I'll do the rest. And so we, we listen to him and we move because he moves us like he moved Abraham. And whether it's a week, a, a month, or a year, we will do this unless he tells us to do something different. But we're listening for his leading and not for what our own understanding or trying to please him by doing more. Try, try, trying to go out and recruit people for the kingdom. He will do it all. He will get the glory and we will be blessed. Amen. Praise the Lord. Here it comes to the revelation that, that God gave me in this because... Um, because he chose to do it and what's brought forth this message today. I'm going to talk about the love of a parent. Um, I'm going to uh, share a thick picture. I got to move the laptop around. So uh, one moment, bear with me. I'm going to turn my camera off and then I'll turn it back on again. One moment. No, it's okay. I'm sure I can manage. One moment. Those of you online can already see it. What I have here is a uh, picture of a man who's on death row with his mother on the other side of the glass. Now, this man has obviously done something so heinous and so terrible that he was deserving of a death penalty. Something very vile that probably all of us would con condemn and be happy that he's facing judgment and so forth. And so, um, oh, I thought I turned off the camera. Sorry, folks. All right. Um, but you, what you see here is this mother doesn't care what he's done. This mother sees her little boy that she gave birth to. And no matter what he's done, she's with him all the way to the end. And that's God. That's the beginning of God's love for us. God is our heavenly father. 
And everybody here, everybody on this planet has done things deserving of death. And this is how God looks at us. The beginning of God, how God looks at us. He looks at us as my child, my child. Remember, he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how long I wanted to gather you together like a hen gathers her chicks together, but you would not listen. He loves them. He wants them, but he gives free will to people as well. But he draws and he draws them and he loves the ones who are deserving of death, including all of us at one time. Amen. But that's not that's not the limit of God's love. That's parental love on this earth. Yes. But we're going to go farther. God takes it to the next level. This is what God has shown me. Not only does he love us who, um, who are, have done, some, done things worthy of death, God does not just accept us as, well, as, just as we are. This is what I hear a lot. God accepts you just as you are. God loves you just as you are. But God loves us despite how we are. He's not saying, oh, I love you in the midst of your mess and all you've done. No, you've messed up like that man who's got a death sentence. And I still love you anyway. But God still loves us even more. He loves us enough not to leave us in our current condition. Not only did he say, I'm going to go in place of my son and my daughter. And I'm going to go over there and I'm going to take that death sentence for them. But I'm not going to leave them in that condition as well. He's going to spend all of his time and his energy renewing us into the image of himself, his son, Jesus Christ, the work and the effort so that we don't have to be guilty anymore, that the world doesn't have to look like, uh, at us like prisoners and guilty con convicts anymore, that he's going to not only redeem us, he's going to bring us into his kingdom undefiled, cleansed and in his image to be true heirs of God in the kingdom forever and ever. Amen. Praise the Lord. He loves us enough not to be as we are. He, he says, I know you're a mess and I, I got you and I paid the price, but I'm also not going to let you swim in that mess. Give your life, surrender, yield to my work, and I'm going to make you someone new and you're not going to miss who you once were ever again. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Then what about all this? Well, the Old Testament has all this co condemnation. In the New Testament, God talks about discipline. Why is it that there's so much struggle and strife? And why is there discipline in the church and all these things? If God is so loving and so caring, why, why do we see these things? Why are there hard things? Many of us know in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 11, it says, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons and daughters, I might add. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Chastening is discipline like, like you're getting a, a spanking. That's chastening. Nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. Some of the people in the world may misunderstand and think it's condemnation, but no, it's God's love for his people that he rebukes. He doesn't want to leave us in the condition that he redeemed us in. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Every son or daughter is going to go through discipline. Otherwise, we will not change. That's the bottom line. And he loves us enough not to leave us as we were. If you endure chastening, which he will cause you to do, God deals you with you as sons or daughters for what son is there whom a father does not chasten well in this world it becomes more and more popular not to chasten and discipline your children as a matter of fact they'll make it illegal that you can't discipline your children but if you are without chastening which all have become partakers then you are illegitimate and not sons if you're not going through it because you've given your life to christ then there's something wrong because God is doing a work in us and it takes fire. It takes pressure. It takes discipline for God to change us. Amen. He learned obedience through his sufferings. That's what the word says. Furthermore, we've had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect in most cases. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? 
for they indeed for a few days chasing us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, because he doesn't do anything by mistake, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Amen? And that's what we want, right? Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. There it is. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Amen? When it seems like God is mistreating someone, not being fair, don't worry about it. God is faithful and true. He knows what he's doing. And no matter how it looks, no matter how painful it is, it's only for a moment. His mercies are new every morning. He is in control. Lean not on your own understanding. God is good and he loves everyone. Amen? Amen. Discipline. How does he dish out discipline? One way is through his word. When we're in his word is when we get convicted because it reveals the, the condition we are in. It's the law that draws us to Christ in the first place when we see that we cannot achieve it. But then the word also reveals other things in our heart that he needs to reveal to us, that we need to repent of, that we need to confess. And then he removes it and replaces it with more of his spirit, the love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, patience, and self-control that comes from the spirit of God. Amen? Amen. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Amen? Amen. So when we read the Old Testament, it is not there co to condemn us. If, it, if all of a sudden God says, look, you're being like Esau. Look, you're being like King Saul. It's not because he's saying you're going to be killed like they were. He's giving us a word to show us the part of our flesh that needs to go. And when we come in agreement, we say, oh, God, I see it now. I see that, that covetousness in my heart, and I give it to you. I confess it to a pastor, and I get prayer, and that covetousness is gone. Whatever it is, if we confess our sins, he is righteous to cleanse us from all sins. Amen? He's not here to condemn us. He loves us. He's disciplining us by having us hear his word, read his word, so we can see our condition, so that he can change us into the image of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So that we can have un, unfettered fellowship with him without the flesh getting in the way. Praise the Lord. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 through 13, the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Amen? Amen. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Amen? It is the word. What a wonderful gift the word is that God has given us. It's a mirror into our soul. And it's there, again, not to condemn us. It's not for us to hide from. Adam and Eve were trying to hide behind, behind fig leaves, but the word came to them anyway. And said, no, no, did you do that? Confess to me and I will provide your covering. Uh, there will be blood shed and I will give you skin to cover yourself. I just want you to be honest with me. Tell me what you've done and I will heal you and I will change you. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Discipline also comes through experiences that God brings us to. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Let's look at this an experience that someone went through that ultimately brought them closer to God, closer to their father. We go to Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 31. Thank you. Excuse me. <clears throat> then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Now, 
the father here loves his son and he can i'm sure he's taught him many things but the son wouldn't listen to the word of his father he thought he knew what was best for his life and so rather than chaining him home the father understood that he's got to experience things to learn the truth and so when we see brothers and sisters going through things maybe they leave maybe they they rebel maybe they persecute whatever they're doing god is not lost track of what's going on in their lives he knows exactly what's going on and he will allow people to go through his experiences that will bring because he loves them he knows will ultimately bring them with a full heart to himself instead of half a heart amen so this this son younger son goes to this far country wastes his possessions with prodigal living but when he had spent all there arose a severe famine in that land that he began to be in want all of a sudden all what he thought was the best thing for his life ended up to come become, become empty and there was nothing left he had nothing then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into his field to feed swine to feed the pigs that's all you end up with when you leave god's will and he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate and no one gave him anything because the world is not going to take care of you the world is not going to do that only god is going to take care of all those who put their trust in him but when he came to himself when he got the revelation he said how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare and i perish with hunger i will rise and go to my father and i will say to him father i've sinned against heaven and before you repentance comes when we're brought to our knees when we're done with our, our own strength and trying to make it our way amen and i'm no longer worthy to be called your son make me like one of your hired servants that's repentance that's what god allows in the lives of his children because he loves them and they're not going to get it unless they go through something and he arose and came to his father but when he was still a great way off his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him amen if this doesn't prove the love of god what does well we repent and we see the error of our ways and we're coming back thinking that we don't deserve anything and he is sitting there waiting with open arms saying my son here i am i'm coming to you and i'm gonna hug you and i'm gonna bless you and the son said to him father i've sinned against heaven and in your sight i'm no longer worthy to be called your son but the father said to his servants bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and he's found and they began to be merry amen amen there is no need for us to judge anyone anymore. There's no need for us to be angry with anyone anymore. God knows all things and God will bring every single one of us into his love. Amen. Amen. We can trust him to do that because this is what God does. Now his older son, we, we kind of see a change in the story. His older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and because he received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. He pleaded with the son that never went anywhere, who stayed with his father the whole time. And my battery is running low. Oh, Lord, help us. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you and never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. 
But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. This son or daughter of yours who abandoned us, who persecuted us, who did all these things against us, and then he comes back, and then we have a celebration. And he said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. Amen. Sometimes we too feel like we are more, more deserving of God's love than others. This is what God's put in my heart today. Amen. Because somebody's done something we haven't. But God's love is not like that. God loves everyone and he knows that everyone's got to go through what they need to go through. But for those who have been faithful, his love and his blessings are here for us without having to go and feed swine, without having to go through the things that the other people have to go through to bring brought to the same place. It's a blessing that we don't have to go through all those things. We all go through something anyway, but thank God that not all of us have to go through some of the hard things that others have to go through. So we're all, he's with us all the way. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. For the sake of, uh, I, I want to just, uh, in case we lose the battery, I don't want to lose the service. So I'm going to try to get back on Zoom on my phone. Not yet, not yet. Because I'm going to try to get the, uh, yeah. What's the meeting passcode? Meeting passcode six. Eight, four. Okay, there we go. Praise the Lord. Um, I can try. No, I can't. I can't. Yeah. Okay, I'm muted. <laughs> my audio is there. Okay, sorry, I'm gonna turn my audio there. All right, just in case we lose the other one, just bear with me. All right. We are here on this planet, I kind of touched on this earlier, to let others see who God is. And what we're talking about today is who God is. That's the bottom line. First Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 7 says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so I can remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. God gives us these wonderful spiritual gifts. But if we're not walking in love, we're not walking in his image. All those things are just great. but And they get people's attention. But it will not draw people to himself. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely, it does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And then in verse 13, I don't know where it went, but in, in all these three things abide, faith, hope, and love but the greatest of these is love. Amen? Amen? This is what God wants out of us more than anything else. Forget about all the rest. It's all secondary. If we cannot love, we cannot represent God. This is not a condemnation. It's God asking us to check ourselves. And we're, when, when we see that we're walk, not walking in love, to get prayer so that we, he can heal us and he can open our hearts and then he... His love will flow through us to the world. Amen. First John chapter four, verses seven through 21 says, beloved, let us not love one another. Let us love one another for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. 
He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And this, the love of God was manifested towards us, that God sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also love to one, love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the father has sent the son as savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God God abides in him and he is in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. That is the simplicity of the gospel that God loves us. He redeemed us. And now he wants us to walk in love like the Christian pilgrim. Follow the light. Don't try to figure out. Don't try to help God. Don't try to be righteous in your own sight. Don't try to get overeducated, but walk with him in love. And then he will work his love through us, in us, and um, around to the people around us. Amen? Amen? The woman at the well didn't have to know everything. All she needed to know was that God knew her and loved her. And then she shared that love and people came and saw him themselves. Love has perf been perfected among us in this, that we may, be, we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. If we have fear, we confess it and ask God to replace it with faith and love in our hearts. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God, God must love his brother also. Amen? Amen. Amen. But love isn't enabling. Love is knowing that whatever God's will is for a person is what the truth is. That God is working in love through that person. So it's always about seeking God's leading. It's always about paying attention and trusting that what's happening is God doing it. Amen. John 15 verses 11 through 13. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may rem remain in you, that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. He did that, and we are called to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters out there as well. Which means, again, letting go of our own ideas and our own understanding and our own works, and then just walking with him and opening our hearts and letting God do what he's got to do. Amen? Amen. So we got a little more encouraging scriptures. Try to get to the end here. Words to remember about God's love for us. Jeremiah 31 3 says, The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. That's not just for Jeremiah, that's for each and every person here. Everyone here. Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Let your conduct be without. Oh, that was it. That's that verse. The next one is Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself said, I will never leave.